Welcome to CMES Conversations, a series of interviews with leading scholars and thinkers hosted by the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver. This week's guest on CMES Conversations is Shafiq Ghabra, Professor of Political Science at Kuwait University. Professor Ghabra was a Carnegie Centennial Visiting Scholar with the University of Denver's Center for Middle East Studies in January 2015. Professor Ghabra is the author of many books, including Palestinians in Kuwait, Family and the Politics of Survival, and several books in Arabic, including Israel wal Arab, Sara al Qadiyya ila al Salam al Masalah, Israel and the Arabs, From the Conflict of Issues to the Peace of Interests, and Hayat Ghair Amina, Jil al Ahlam wal Akhfaqat, An Unsafe Life. The Generation of Dreams and Disappointments. Professor Gabra is also a columnist for the Arabic language newspaper Al Hayat. Thank you for joining us on this episode of CMES Conversations. Dr. Gabra, it's been a huge honor and privilege having you at our Center for Middle East Studies as a visiting scholar. Um, one of the things that really impressed me about um, your background and your current uh, work is how you travel around the Arab world and you have your finger on the pulse of the politics and societies of the Arab Islamic world very well. I'm very impressed by that. We're going through a very difficult moment now, post-Arab Spring, um, a lot of um, pessimism about the future of the Arab world in terms of political development. But when you spoke last week on campus, you sort of ended your uh, lecture with a, a note of optimism. Um, where and, and based on what is that optimism coming from? Well, the optimism comes from the fact that uh, the Arab world, uh, um, from any side, from any direction, we try to analyze it and understand it, uh, has been uh, kind of for a long time frozen in time, in space, frozen in its politics. Mm -hmm. And that suddenly you get a, an avalanche, you get a, an, an, an over uh, huge reaction, uh, the Arab Spring. And that sets a stage for activism, movements, uh, needs, aspirations, hopes, wants. Democratic learning. Democratic learning, yeah. institutional learning, yeah. learning to live together and to differ at mm -hmm. the same time. Uh, so the Arab world went through such a huge big change if, with 2011, four presidents, uh, several revolutions, mm -hmm. movements across the region, across the Arab world, and then there was the counter-revolution. But you have also the bed on all of this is lying, actually, the, the, the bed is, is sitting on a, a big, huge youth bulge. Mm -hmm. And it is there where I get my optimism. Mm -hmm. I feel that the youth of the Arab world, despite that, some of the extremists are youth, some mm -hmm. of the moderates are youth, right. some of the activists are youth, some of the yeah. revolutionary are youth, not, but youth today are out. Yeah. And they will either be uh, revolutionaries mm -hmm. or they will be um, uh, very extremist mm -hmm. or they will be whatever they want to be. I don't see them going back home. Yeah. So what this adds to us is the responsibility mm -hmm. of putting forward a reform agenda mm -hmm. for the region, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an agenda that can take the region a step mm -hmm. or two or more, mm -hmm. and, and that could engage the youth. Yeah. Because if we do not engage the youth, yeah. we will lose them yeah. to extremism, yeah. potentially fascism. Right. But there is a huge youth bulge yeah. that is there to be politicized, already politicized, and on the way to give more. Yeah. And it's up to us how to engage it. Uh, speaking of the youth, when I was in Kuwait recently, I was very impressed by the young people that I met. Those that had invited me, they seem to be um, reflecting this mm. sentiment that you're, you're articulating right now. Mm. Very interested in political activity, in mobilizing civil society, mm. in mm -hmm. promoting peaceful political change. Um, the events of the Arab Spring also impacted the Gulf, in particular Kuwait. But a lot of people don't know that, that part of the story. Could you tell us a little bit about what was happening politically, how the Arab Spring affected political yes, dynamics I mean, in Kuwait? I would say that the events of the Arab Spring impacted every Arab country uh, in one way or another. 
in some places intellectually, in others in terms of media and freedom, and in, in, in some it, it opened up the eyes of people on certain aspects and issues. In Kuwait, it did contribute to a social, political, reform-oriented movement at the grassroots level. And that went on. I cannot say this is the direct impact only of the Arab Spring. Such movements, even the Arab Spring itself, you will always see that there are roots a year, two, three, like in Egypt, Kifaya. Yeah. So you, you can also trace movements in Kuwait, youth movements in Kuwait, several years before uh, uh, their uh, clear expression yeah. in 212, but 212 was a turning point. Yeah. And that created a, quite a dynamic with the state, that created a dynamic with the country. Uh, people were divided all, over issues. Uh, uh, it's, it's the dynamic is still on, and the demands are still on the table, which is more reform, more participation, a say in the politics and of the country. Um, a resolution to the conflict between the Kuwaiti parliament and the government of Kuwait, by which parliament has more powers. Mm -hmm. The right to have political parties, so far that right is not there on the table. You have political movements, but not political parties that run for election, that ends up creating some form of a government that has a majority. So I think looking at reforming, improving, changing, advancing the existing political system within the framework of the existing institutions, particularly within the framework of the existing uh, Kuwaiti constitution. So am I right to um, conclude that your optimism comes from the fact that the frozen era of politics where people were apolitical and apathetic, that era seems to have shifted to a new era where at least people are politicized. Yes. There's only been one democratic transition in Tunisia, but at least the lingering effects of the desire for political exactly. change and agitation continues to shape popular sentiment. Yes. It's, it's like this Arab Spring is like the Big Bang. The Big Bang, yeah. It opened the space. Mm -hmm. Nobody can close it again uh, by recreating the same conditions that existed before the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. It opened the space. If you want to close it, that's possible. However, you need to make wide range of reforms mm -hmm. and changes mm -hmm. in state society relations, in the issues of domination, in, in the issues of um, power politics. You need to open up people's power, people's mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. has to be represented today at is, is the center stage of these movements. Speaking of the Arab Spring, one last question on the Arab Spring. The one area of the Arab Spring where the conflict continues and uh, by wide margin has had the most devastating consequences and now has become a global issue, um, spreading all the way to Paris, I would argue, is the conflict in Syria. The rise of ISIS and the conflict in Syria continues to bleed, continues to destabilize not only Syria, not only the Middle East, but now it's a global problem. What should the world do about Syria? How to solve that particular problem? You see, the world left Syria to its fate, did not interfere at the right moment, did not work for a decent resolution from the start. When was the right moment to intervene? Um, the first few months mm -hmm. and uh, the first year at mm -hmm. the max. And the Assad regime believed that uh, uh, the regime has the green light to uh, simply massacre the population. When you look at Syria today, 300,000, 300,000 killed. Um, that's, that's not an, an easy number. Mm -hmm. Millions displaced mm -hmm. in Syria. A total destruction of cities and mm -hmm. towns and villages and places. To whose benefit is this? And, and why should this be allowed to continue at that mm -hmm. level? So leaving the Syrian conflict this way uh, did contribute to the part of the radicalism mm -hmm. that today we see emerging in the region. If you mm -hmm. look at the moment of 2-11, uh, Qaeda didn't stand out, didn't yeah. even, you look for Al-Qaeda, yeah. the region became irrelevant. Right. Al-Qaeda kind of disappeared from the radar. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all these peaceful civil rights, mm -hmm. civil uh, society activists. Non-violent non change. Non-violent, wanting yeah. to uh, solve issues and change without uh, mm -hmm. violence. Mm -hmm. uh, so a new school was emerging. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, regimes, uh, came very mm -hmm. strong against those mm -hmm. uh, revolutionaries and activists, non-violent, mm -hmm. and in, by doing so, they have been encouraging the violence. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, 
uh, on the other hand, by leaving Syria open-ended, mm -hmm. that has also encouraged mm -hmm. another school of violence. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's wide open. There are so many mm -hmm. dimensions now to the Arab world, and uh, uh, these are expressions of mm -hmm. lack of justice. Mm -hmm. They're not expressions of religion. Mm -hmm. They are expressions of uh, marginalization. Mm -hmm. They are expressions of people whose lost their space, mm -hmm. who have no space, mm -hmm. whose death to them is the only space still remaining. Right. And therefore, uh, the world has a responsibility to, mm -hmm. to engage and mm -hmm. to, uh, to open spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that extremism uh, has causes. Mm -hmm. It's not that people were born like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And the causes are well rooted in mm -hmm. socio-economic, political, cultural, Arab-Israeli as well, conditions right. that uh, will continue to make them even worse mm -hmm. uh, uh, as time passes. And this is the need yeah. for engagement. Uh, and the whole region yeah. is now between different. So we have more than one paradigm. Right. We have more than one school. It's a very politicized region, mm -hmm. and it will continue to be so as long as lack of democracy and too many injustices mm -hmm. continues. Okay, one final question. Uh, during your time here with us as a visiting scholar, um, the, the Charlie Hebdo massacre took place in, in Paris, um, along with the attack on the kosher market. And of course, the connections with the Arab Islamic mm -hmm. world were very much part of that story. Yeah. Watching these horrific events in, in Paris unfold, as an Arab intellectual, as someone who um, is politically astute, what went through your mind? What's your sort of assessment now that we're a little bit sort of past the events? We have a sense of who the actors were, um, what their connections are to the Middle East. Um, how do you make sense? What's your sort of overall you know, analysis of, of, of that particular event? Um, I mean, on, on the one hand, it saddens me. I mean, it, yeah. I feel sad that that happens uh, uh, against a cartoonist or against any human being. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, it's, it's sad mm -hmm. to see that happen and to see that happen in Paris. On the other hand, uh, Muslims should not get the blame. Uh, you cannot generalize on Muslims. Uh, uh, I'm a Muslim, you're a Muslim. There are many Muslims all mm -hmm. over the world. They're mm -hmm. moderates, they're radicals, they're mm -hmm. uh, civil uh, activists, they're intellectuals, they, they vary in... Uh, uh, so so you, you cannot generalize. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this... This generalization is the problem. Mm -hmm. So an act of violence happens and can happen. And it, there are groups that make such decisions. It's that group who made that decision. Mm -hmm. who, that person in mm -hmm. particular mm -hmm. is to be blamed for it. Mm -hmm. But I can, you cannot generalize on the entire population. And I mentioned in my lecture yeah. that when a group of Jews were involved in the assassination of the Tsar of Russia in mm -hmm. 1881. Yeah. And there were Christians and Jews and others and maybe an atheist. Yeah. But the regime uh, decided to focus on Jews only yeah. in 81. Yeah. And that produced a lot of discrimination yeah. and anti-Semitism, yeah. which resulted in 2.5 yeah. million yeah. Jews leaving yeah. Russia and coming to the United States yeah. between 81 and yeah. 2013. Yeah. So what is this generalization yeah. of an entire community but does not help, will not work, yeah. and will only radicalize more yeah. and bring more problems to everybody. But when you sort of think about um, similar activities that are taking place, you know, we had Paris, you had London on 7-7 in 2005, you had Madrid, you have a major sort of um, crackdown recently in, in Belgium with ties to Syria and ISIS. You have different parts of the world where these events seem to be happening, not in isolation, yes. but as part of a broader pattern. So what's the lessons here? How do we sort of get to a solution in terms of trying to get to the I mean, roots, the, the root causes of this particular militant activity that has its mm -hmm. roots in the Middle East, but now is spreading to Europe and North America? Well, the lesson is we need to you need to focus on the complexity that why should a Frenchman who was born from Algerian ancestry mm -hmm. uh, raised in France speaks French uh, uh, lives in a neighborhood in Paris uh, feel like that mm -hmm. is there something happening what's going on mm -hmm. let's look at that first so let's look at community relations right. and and to what extent are we open? To what mm -hmm. extent are we inclusive? To what extent do we, do we really have a dialogue mm -hmm. going on? To what extent are we open for diversity, for pluralism? To what extent are we true about these ideals of diversity? And, and so I would like to look at this. But on the other hand, I would look at the 
a larger Islamic world. It looks that the Muslims of the world feel to be the marginalized of the world, feel to be at the bottom, feel in stress, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of states uh, in, in turmoil, uh, uh, that the Muslims of the world are in a state of in need of, of, of transition, but that transition needs an eye from the world and, and needs an ear as well from the world. And therefore, the root causes, if I look at the Arab-Israeli conflict, it's left to its destiny mm -hmm. to create more havoc uh, among people and among Muslims and among uh, Jews and among Israelis and among everybody. Havoc, mm -hmm. havoc, there's full domination on the West Bank. There's full domination in Palestine. And there is an attempt as well to, uh, to eradicate more Arab presence in Palestine. Jerusalem, etc. So with, when this is all left open in a state of colonialism or a, or a revival of colonialism or a state of a colonial state yeah. of, uh, of, of policy and practice, uh, then that is radicalizing. And when Arab leaders and Arab rulers are not also up to the challenge and up to even speaking to the world or mm -hmm. up to dealing with the international community the way the Iranians are or the way the Turks are, mm -hmm. then that really creates more frustration mm -hmm. by Arab youth who could go extremist. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Shafiq, I could spend all day speaking with you, but um, you have to give a lecture tonight. And we have to get you to dinner, so I want to thank you for being with us on these conversations. It's a pleasure. pleasure thank you to very have much. Been here. My pleasure.